Section 12 of Across Asia on a Bicycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in July 2016. Across Asia on a Bicycle by Thomas Allen. Chapter 6 An Interview with the Prime Minister of China. Our departure from Lan Chou was not, we thought, regretted by the officials themselves, for we heard that apprehension was expressed lest the crowds continuing to collect around the telegraph office should indulge in a riot. However, we were loath to leave our general friends for the society of opium smokers, for we were now in that province of China which, next to Sichuan, is most addicted to this habit. From dusk till bedtime the streets of the villages were almost deserted for the squalid opium dens. Even our soldier attendant, as soon as the wooden saddle was taken from his sore-backed government steed, would produce his portable lamp and proceed to melt on his needle the wax-like contents of a small black box. When of the proper consistency, the paste was rolled on a metal plate to point it for the aperture in the flute-shaped pipe. Half the night would be given to this process, and a considerable portion of the remaining half would be devoted to smoking small pinches of tobacco in the peculiar Chinese water pipe. According to an official note issued early in 1882 by Mr. Hart, Inspector General of Chinese Customs, considerably less than 1% of the population is addicted to opium smoking, while those who smoke it to excess are few. More to be feared is the use of opium as a poison, especially among Chinese women. The government raises large sums from the import duty on opium and tacitly connives at its cultivation in most of the provinces, where the traders and mandarins share between them the profits of this officially prohibited drug. This part of the great historic highway on which we were now travelling, between the two bends of the Huang Ho, was found more extensively patronized than heretofore. Besides the usual caravans of horses, donkeys, and two-wheeled vans, we occasionally met with a party of shaven-headed Tibetans traveling either as emissaries or as traders in the famous Tibetan sheepskins and furs and the strongly scented bags of the musk deer. A funeral cortege was also a very frequent sight. Chinese custom requires that the remains of the dead be brought back to their native place, no matter how far they may have wandered during life, and as the carriage of a single body would often be expensive, they are generally interred in temporary cemeteries or mortuary villages until a sufficient number can be got together to form a large convoy. Mandarins, however, in death as in life, travel alone and with retinue. One coffin we met which rested upon poles supported on the shoulders of thirty-two men. Above on the coffin was perched the usual white rooster which is supposed to incorporate, during transportation, the spirit of the departed. In funeral ceremonies, especially of the father, custom also requires the children to give public expression of their grief. Besides many other filial observances, the eldest son is in duty bound to render the journey easy for the departed by scattering fictitious paper money, a spirit toll, at the various roadside temples. Singan Fu, the capital of the Middle Kingdom under the Qin dynasty, and a city of the first importance more than two thousand years ago, is still one of the largest places in the empire, being exceeded in population probably by Canton alone. Each of its four walls, facing the cardinal points, is over six miles long and is pierced in the centre by a monumental gate with lofty pavilions. It was here, among the ruins of an old Nestorian church, built several centuries before, that was found the famous tablet now sought at a high price by the British Museum. The harassing mobs gathered from its teeming population, as well as the lateness of the season, prompted us to make our sojourn as short as possible. Only a day sufficed to reach Tong Kwan, which is the central stronghold of the Huang Ho Basin and one of the best defended points in China. Here, between precipitous cliffs, this giant stream rushes madly by, as if in protest against its sudden deflection. 
our ferry this time was not the back of a chinese coolie nor a jolting ox-cart but a spacious flat boat made to accommodate one or two vehicles at a time this was rowed at the stern like the gondolas of venice the mob of hundreds that had been dogging our footsteps and making life miserable during our brief stop for food watched our embarkation we reached the opposite shore a mile below the starting point and began to ascend from the river basin to the highlands by an excavated fissure in the famous yellow earth this gives its name not only to the river it discolors but from the extensive region comprised even to the emperor himself who takes the title of yellow lord as equivalent to master of the world the thickness of this the richest soil in china which according to baron richthofen is nothing more than so much dust accumulated during the course of ages by the winds from the northern deserts is in some places at least two thousand feet much ingenuity has been displayed in overcoming the difficulties offered for free communication by the perpendicular walls of these yellow lands some of the most frequented roads have been excavated to depths of from forty to one hundred feet being seldom more than eight or ten feet wide the wheeled traffic is conducted by means of sidings like the stations in the suez canal being undrained or unswept by the winds these walled-up tracks are either dust beds or quagmires according to the season for us the autumn rains had converted them into the latter although on one of the imperial highways which once excited the admiration of marco polo we were now treated to some of the worst stretches we have ever seen the mountain ascents especially those stair-like approaches to the heavenly gates before reaching the pechili plains were steep gradeless inclines strewn with huge upturned blocks of stone over which the heavy carts were fairly lifted by the sheer force of additional horse-flesh the bridges too whose roman-like masonry attests the high degree of chinese civilization during the middle ages have long since been abandoned to the ravages of time while over the whole country the late dungan rebellion has left its countless ruins the people of shansi province are noted for their special thrift but this quality we observed was sometimes exhibited at the expense of the higher virtue of honesty one of the most serious of the many cases of attempted extortion occurred at a remote country town where we arrived late one evening after learning to our dismay that one of our remarkably few mistakes in the road had brought us just fifty miles out of the way unusually wearied as we were by the cross-country cuts we desired to retire early in fact on this account we were not so observant of chinese formality as we might have been we did not heed the hinted requests of the visiting officials for a moonlight exhibition nor go to the inn door to bow them respectfully out we were glad to take them at their word when they said with the usual hypocritical smirk now don't come out any farther this indiscretion on our part caused them as well as ourselves to suffer in the respect of the assembled rabble with official connivance the latter were now free they thought to take unusual liberties so far in our dealings with the chinese we had never objected to anything that was reasonable even from the native point of view we had long since learned the force of the chinese proverb that in order to avoid suspicion you must not live behind closed doors and in consequence had always recognized the common prerogative to ransack our private quarters and our luggage so long as nothing was seriously disturbed we never objected either to their wetting our paper windows with their tongues so that they might noiselessly slit a hole in them with their exceptionally long finger-nails although we did wake up some mornings to find the panes entirely gone it was only at the request of the innkeeper that we sometimes undertook the job of cleaning out the inn-yard but this with the prevalent superstition about the withering touch of the foreigner was very easily accomplished nor had we ever shown the slightest resentment at being called foreign devils for this we learned was with the younger generation at least the only title by which foreigners were known but on this particular night our forbearance being quite exhausted we ejected the intruders bodily mid mutterings and threats we turned out the lights and the crowd as well as ourselves retired 
the next morning the usual exorbitant bill was presented by the innkeeper and as usual one half or one third was offered and finally accepted with the customary protestations about being underpaid the innkeeper's grumblings incited the crowd which early assembled and from their whispers and glances we could see that trouble of some kind was brewing we now hastened to get the wheels on to the road just then the innkeeper at the instigation of the crowd rushed out and grabbed the handlebars demanding at the same time a sum that was even in advance of his original price extortion was now self-evident and remonstrance being of no avail we were obliged to protect ourselves with our fists the crowd began to close in upon us until with our backs against the adjoining wall we drew our weapons at which the onward movement changed suddenly to a retreat then we assumed the aggressive and regained the wheels which had been left in the middle of the road the innkeeper and his friend now caught hold of the rear wheels only by seizing their cues could we drag them away at all but even then before we could mount they would renew their grasp it was only after another direct attack upon them that we were able to mount and dash away a week's journeying after this unpleasant episode brought us among the peanuts pigs and pigtails of the famous pe chili plains vast fields of peanuts were now being ploughed ready to be passed through a huge coarse sieve to separate the nuts from the sandy loam sweet potatoes too were plentiful these as well as rice balls boiled with a peculiar dry date in a triangular corn leaf wrapper were purchased every morning at daybreak from the pots of the early street menders and then proceeded to the local bake shops where the rattling of the rolling pins prophesied of stringy fat cakes cooked in boiling linseed oil and heavy dough biscuits cleaving to the urn-like oven it was well that we were now approaching the end of our journey for our wheels and clothing were nearly in pieces our bare calves were pinched by the frost for on some of the coldest mornings we would find a quarter of an inch of ice our rest at night was broken for the want of sufficient covering the straw-heated kangs would soon cool off and leave us half the night with only our thin sleeping bags to ward of rheumatism but over the beaten paths made by countless wheelbarrows we were now fast nearing the end it was on the evening of november third that the giant walls of the great residence as the people call their imperial capital broke suddenly into view through a vista in the surrounding foliage the goal of our three thousand one hundred and sixteen mile journey was now before us and the work of the seventy-first riding day almost ended with the dusk of evening we entered the western gate of the manchu city and began to thread its crowded thoroughfares by the time we reached legation street or as the natives egotistically call it the street of the foreign dependencies night had veiled our haggard features and ragged garments in a dimly lighted courtyard we came face to face with the english proprietor of the hotel de peking at our request for lodging he said pardon me but may i first ask who you are and where you come from our unprepossessing appearance was no doubt a sufficient excuse for this precaution but just then his features changed and he greeted us effusively explanations were now superfluous the north china herald correspondent at pao ting hu had already published our story to the coast that evening the son of the united states minister visited us and offered a selection from his own wardrobe until a chinese tailor could renew our clothing with borrowed plumes we were able to accept invitations from foreign and chinese officials polite cross-examinations were not infrequent and we fear that entire faith in our alleged journey was not general until by riding through the dust and mud of legation street we proved that chinese roads were not altogether impracticable for bicycle travelling the autumn rains had so flooded the low-lying country between the capital and its seaport tientsin that we were obliged to abandon the idea of continuing to the coast on the wheels which by this time were in no condition to stand unusual strain on the other hand the houseboat journey of thirty-six hours down the pei ho river was a rather pleasant diversion our first evening on the river was made memorable by an unusual event 
suddenly the rattling of tin pans the tooting of horns and the shouting of men women and children aroused us to the realization that something extraordinary was occurring then we noticed that the full moon in a cloudless sky had already passed the halfway mark in a total eclipse our boatmen now joined in the general uproar which reached its height when the moon was entirely obscured in explanation we were told that the great dragon was endeavouring to swallow up the moon and that the loudest possible noise must be made to frighten him away shouts hailed the reappearance of the moon although our boatmen had a spattering of pigeon or business english we were unable to get a very clear idea of chinese astronomy in journeying across the empire we found sufficient analogy in the various provincial dialects to enable us to acquire a smattering of one from another as we proceeded but we were now unable to see any similarity whatever between you makey wokey look see and you go and see or between that belong number one pigeon and that is a first-class business this jargon has become a distinct dialect on the chinese coast on our arrival in Tientsin, we called upon the United States Consul, Colonel Bowman, to whom we had brought several letters from friends in Peking. During a supper at his hospitable home, he suggested that the Viceroy might be pleased to receive us, and that, if we had no objection, he would send a communication to the Yamen, or official residence. Colonel Bowman's secretary, Mr. Tenney, who had been some time the instructor of the Viceroy's sons, and who was on rather intimate terms with the viceroy himself kindly offered to act as interpreter a favourable answer was received the next morning and the time for our visit fixed for the afternoon of the day following but two hours before the appointed time a message was received from the viceroy stating that he was about to receive an unexpected official visit from the fan tai or treasurer of the pei chili province over which li hung chang himself is viceroy and asking for a postponement of our visit to the following morning at eleven o'clock even before we had finished reading this unexpected message the booming of cannon along the pei ho river announced the arrival of the fan tai's boats before the city the postponement of our engagement at this late hour threatened to prove rather awkward inasmuch as we had already purchased our steamship tickets for shanghai to sail on the fei ching at five o'clock the next morning but through the kindness of the steamship company it was arranged that we should take a tug-boat at tong ku on the line of the kai ping railroad and overtake the steamer outside the taku bar this we could do by taking the train at tientsin even as late as seven hours after the departure of the steamer steam navigation in the pei ho river over the forty or fifty miles stretch from tientsin to the gulf is rendered very slow by the sharp turns in the narrow stream the adjoining banks being frequently struck and ploughed away by the bow or stern of the large ocean steamers when we entered the consulate the next morning we found three palanquins and a dozen coolies in waiting to convey our party to the viceroy's residence under other circumstances we would have patronized our steeds of steel but a visit to the biggest man in china had to be conducted in state we were even in some doubt as to the propriety of appearing before his excellency in bicycle costume but we determined to plead our inability to carry luggage as an excuse for this breach of etiquette the first peculiarity the chinese notice in a foreigner is his dress it is a requisite with them that the clothes must be loose and so draped as to conceal the contour of the body the short sack coat and tight trousers of the foreigner are looked upon as certainly inelegant if not actually indecent it was not long before we were out of the foreign settlement and wending our way through the narrow winding streets or lanes of the densely populated chinese city the palanquins we met were always occupied by some high dignitary or official who went sweeping by with his usual vanguard of servants and his usual frown of excessive dignity the fact that we plain foreign devils were using this mode of locomotion made us the objects of considerable curiosity from the loiterers and passers-by and in fact had this not been the case we should have felt rather uncomfortable the unsympathetic observation of mobs and the hideous chinese noises 
had become features of our daily life. End of section 12